Hey folks, uh, Mr. Howard here again. Um, I'm bringing you chapter 12 of the picture of Dorian Gray. Last time we read chapter 11, I think I got most of it on film. Um, obviously it was a ridiculously long chapter um, and, and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense in terms of its style. Um, you know, the content's important that you see Dorian living his life of a new hedonism. You see him uh, going through the, the process of collecting sensations, um, of uh, reading more and more of the book and falling more into corruption of um, comparing his life to those of his ancestors and finding excuses for who he is of becoming more paranoid all of these things are important but the idea that Oscar Wilde the celebrate celebrated playwright who is really immensely good at writing dialogue would write a chapter with zero dialogue in it um, that was entirely uh, Narrator, narrated description of things that happened um, in this sort of past tense, passive way. Uh, it didn't make a whole lot of sense stylistically. It feels like an outlier to the entire book, um, and it's difficult to get through, I'm not going to lie. But lots of great books have those difficult sections to get through. You read Frankenstein, you get the first few chapters, uh, which are letters from Walton. You read The Iliad, and there's a chapter in there that's entirely like just descriptions of ships and crews and who they are and where they come from. It just goes on forever. Uh, so whatever, we take the good with the bad. Um, we got through that chapter. We learned the important lessons from it. Now we're moving into chapter 12, which is sort of the beginning of the second section of the book, the story of uh, Dorian Gray as an older person. Uh, but remember that he looks exactly like he did uh, on the first day of the book, chapter 2, uh, when he talked to Lord Henry in the garden because of his, his wish. So we're going to pick up on chapter 12. I'm going to read it out loud and give you whatever commentary I can. Uh, it was the 9th of November, the eve of his own 38th birthday, as he often remembered afterwards. This is Dorian's birthday, by the way. He's 38. That means it's 18 years later after the book has started. So a long period of time has passed. Uh, also, anybody born on November 10th, you share a birthday with Dorian Gray. So great, I guess. Um, he was walking home about 11 o'clock from Lord Henry. So that tells us that he's still with Lord Henry. He's still being influenced in that way where he had been dining, and was wrapped in a heavy furs as the night was cold and foggy. Pause. Uh, those of you that read a lot of literature, you know that weather has symbolic significance. Fog is generally representative of confusion or mystery. So there's an air of mystery going on at this particular point. Um, it's, it's that way because you can't see. Uh, but you know all weather has. Rain is sadness and sorrow. Sometimes it's baptism or rebirth. Snow is uh, cold and death. Um... You know, and uh, storms or conflict. You can look at how weather has symbolic implications in stories, and there's no better place for that than Shakespeare. So obviously, as a playwright, Oscar Wilde would have been well informed on that, and certainly is using that in his writings. Um, as the night was cold and foggy, at the corner of Grosvenor Square and South Audley Street... I know, pause again. Uh, South Audley Street. Audley is an interesting choice of a street because there was a book, a mystery book, that had made a big hit recently in the Victorian age when this was written. It was called Lady Audley's Secret. Some of you read it uh, as an outside reading book for the Gothic Novel Project. Uh, so this is probably an allusion to that. Uh, anyway, at the corner of Grosvenor Square in South Audley Street, a man passed him in the mist, walking very fast, and with the collar of his great Ulster turned up, and Ulster's a raincoat. He had a bag in his hand, Dorian recognized him. It was Basil Hallward. Ah, uh, Basil, we haven't seen him in a while. Uh, a strange sense of fear for which he could not account came over him. He made no sign of recognition and went on quickly in the direction of his own house. Now, if Basil represents sort of an angelic force or God or whatever, the sense of fear that Dorian has when he sees Basil makes, makes some sense. Uh, and Dorian tries to flee. But Hallward had seen him. Dorian heard him first stopping on the pavement and then hurrying after him. In a few moments, his hand was upon his arm. Dorian, what an extraordinary piece of luck. I have been waiting for you in your library ever since nine o'clock. Finally, I took pity on your tired servant and told him to go to bed as he let me out. I am off to Paris by the midnight train, and I particularly wanted to see you before I left. I thought it was you, or rather, your fur coat as you passed, but I wasn't quite sure. Didn't you recognize me? In this fog, my dear Basil? Why, I can't even recognize Grosvenor Square. I believe my house is somewhere about here, but I don't feel at all certain about it. I am sorry you are going away, as I have not seen you for ages, but I suppose you will be back soon. No, 
I'm going to be out of England for six months. I intend to take a studio in Paris and shut myself up till I have finished a great picture I have in my head. However, it wasn't about myself I wanted to talk. Here we are at your door. Let me come in for a moment. I have something to say to you. Pause again. So there's a couple of things here. Obviously, Dorian's lying to Basil, said he didn't even recognize him, but he clearly did, so that he's trying to avoid talking to Basil entirely, trying to avoid him, uh, period. Um, so I think there's that. But let's go back to chapter one. Uh, when we were first introduced to Basil, it said that he disappeared. Uh, and uh, here we are having him going off to... Um, Paris. So I think there's, you know, maybe a connection there for an astute reader to see. Uh, he also said in chapter one that he never tells anybody where he's going when he's going somewhere. Nobody knows uh, because it adds romance to his life. So all of these things are probably connected. Uh, so the only other thing that, that I think is important from that little bit is that uh, Basil says, I have something to say to you. He's not interested in the conversation with Dorian. He wants to tell him something. And uh, this differs from sort of Lord Henry's style. I shall be charmed, but won't you miss your train, said Dorian Gray languidly, as he passed up the steps and opened the door with his latch key. The lamplight struggled out through the fog, that's personification, and Hallward looked at his watch. I have heaps of time, he answered. The train doesn't go till 12.15, and it's only just 11. In fact, I was on my way to the club to look for you when I met you. You see... I shan't have any delay about luggage that I've sent on my heavy things. All I have with me is this bag, and I can easily get to Victoria in 20 minutes. Dorian looked, him, looked at him and smiled. What a way for a fashionable painter to travel. A Gladstone bag and an ulster. Come in, or the fog will get into the house. And mind you, don't talk about anything serious. Nothing nowadays is serious. At least nothing should be. Uh, so this is an indication that Dorian doesn't want to take his life seriously and his life choices seriously, and he doesn't want to talk about himself. Howard shook his head as he entered, so it shows that he dis disagrees with that sort of standard. Um, Howard's a very serious guy, as opposed to Lord Henry, who's a very frivolous guy, and we can talk about the themes and what that represents. Uh, and followed Dorian into the library. I guess I'm going to talk about it. It's, it's who I am. I think it's interesting that a character who represents sort of realism is a frivolous one, and a character who represents romanticism is the one who's serious all the time. Uh, this idea that the, the people who, who romanticize and idealize the world uh, do it from a standpoint of wanting to make the world a better place, wanting to make it um, seriously better, and the ones who accept it for what it is, uh, their defense mechanism is not to take anything seriously. And I think that may be something that Oscar Wilde is trying to say here. Um, where was I? Howard shook his head as he entered and followed Dorian into the library. There was a bright wood fire blazing in the large open hearth. The lamps were lit, and an open Dutch silver spirit case stood with some siphons of soda water and large cut glass tumblers on a little marquetry table. You see, your servant made me quite at home, Dorian. He gave me everything I wanted, including your best gold-tipped cigarettes. He's the most hospitable creature. I like him much better than the Frenchman you used to have. What has become of the Frenchman, by the by? Dorian shrugged his shoulders. I believe he married Lady Radley's maid, and has established her in Paris as an English dressmaker. Anglomania is very fashionable over there now, I hear. It seems very silly of the French, doesn't it? But, do you know, he was not at all a bad servant. I never liked him, but I had nothing to complain about. One imagines, often imagines things that are quite absurd. That's sort of a, a shout-out to his paranoia. You remember Victor and how paranoid Dorian was of him. He was really very devoted to me and seemed quite sorry when he went away. Have another brandy and soda, or would you like a hawk and seltzer? I always take hawk and seltzer myself. There is sure to be some in the next room. Thanks, I won't have anything more, said the painter, taking his cap and coat off and throwing them on, on the bag that he placed in the corner. And now, my dear fellow, I want to speak to you seriously. Bum, bum, bum. Right, like that flies in the face of what Dorian said earlier. Don't frown like that. You make it so much more difficult for me. What is it all about, cried Dorian, in his petulant way, flinging himself down on the sofa. I hope it is not about myself. I am tired of myself tonight. I should like to be somebody else. It is about yourself, answered Hallward in his grave, deep voice. And I must say it to you. I shall only keep you half an hour. Dorian sighed and lit a cigarette. Half an hour, he murmured. It is not much to ask of you, Dorian, and it is entirely for your own sake that I am speaking. I think it right that you should know that the most dreadful things are being said against you in London. I don't wish to know anything about them. I love scandals about other people, but scandals about myself don't interest me. They have not got the charm of novelty. 
Uh, in other words, it almost admits that he uh, has done those scandals. They're not new to him. He's heard all about them. They must interest you, Dorian. Every gentleman is interested in his good name. You don't want people to talk of you as something vile and degraded. Of course, you have your position and your wealth and all that kind of thing. But position and wealth are not everything. Mind you, I don't believe these rumors at all. At least I can't believe them when I see you. Sin is a thing that writes itself across a man's face. It cannot be concealed. People talk sometimes of secret vices. There are no such things. If a wretched man has a vice, it shows itself in the lines of his mouth, the droop of his eyelids, the molding of his hands, even. Pause. Uh, so here's Basil uh, talking to Dorian. Uh, he says he can't think of him as something vile and degraded. Those are interesting words because they're words that juxtapose uh, unspoiled and innocent words that generally apply to Dorian's uh appearance, not necessarily his actions or his personality. Uh, and so the contrast is, is coming out. 18 years of, of negative behavior are starting to have a negative trail of consequences that people are talking about. And Basil can't stand that Dorian, his creation, I guess, or, or however you want to look at that, if he's a God figure, uh, has these things said about him. Uh, but he can't believe them when he sees Dorian, right? Because he says sin is the thing that writes itself across a man's face. That's obviously metaphorical. Nobody writes sin across a guy's face. Uh, but the idea is when you do evil things, when you do bad things, it has physical effects. Like when you smoke, you get a cough. Or, you know, if you become an opium addict, you, you get hollow, sunken eyes and your skin turns yellow. If you're on meth, you know, you got your face picked off and you're missing teeth, right? So there's always negative effects. If you're drunk, you end up with a beer belly. But Dorian has had none of these negative effects. So when Basil looks at him, he still looks pure and perfect. And that's, you know, what's coming across here. Um, somebody, I won't mention his name, but you know him, came to me last year to have his portrait done. I had never seen him before and I had never heard anything about him at that time, though I've heard a good deal since. He offered an extravagant price. I refused him. There was something in the shape of his fingers that I hated. I know now that I was quite right in what I fancied about him. His life is dreadful. But you, Dorian, you with your pure, bright, innocent face and your marvelous, untroubled youth, I can't believe anything against you. And yet, I see you very seldom, and you never come down to the studio now. And when I'm away from you, I hear all these hideous things that people are whispering about you. I don't know what to say. Why is it, Dorian? that a man like the Duke of Berwick leaves a room of a club when you enter it. Why is it that so many gentlemen in London will neither go to your house nor invite you to theirs? You used to be a friend of Lord Staveley. I met him at dinner last week. Your name happened to come up in a con conversation in connection with the miniatures you had lent to the exhibi exhibition at the Dudley. Staveley curled his lip and said that you might have the most artistic tastes, but that you were a man whom no pure-minded girl should be allowed to know, and whom no chaste woman should sit in the same room with. I reminded him that I was a friend of yours and asked him what he meant. He told me. He told me right out there before everybody. It was horrible. Why is your friendship so fatal to young men? There was that wretched boy in the guards who committed suicide. You were his great friend. I'm going to pause for a second. So... Um, Dorian's ruining the, li ruining the lives of women, um, but he's also ruining the lives of young men. That's a, maybe an indication that he's bisexual, that he, he seems to value beauty rather than um, any kind of traditional sexuality. Um, and this, this young guy in the guards who committed suicide, that's an echo of Sybil Vane. So Dorian seems to be having the same effect on people now that he was having on people earlier. And he doesn't seem to be concerned particularly with the effect that he's having. Um, so I think that echo is important. You were his great friend. There was Sir Henry Ashton, who had to leave England with a tarnished name. You and he were inseparable. What about Adrian Singleton and his dreadful end? What about Lord Kent's only son and his career? I met his father yesterday in St. James Street. He seemed broken with shame and sorrow. What about the young Duke of Perth? What sort of life has he now? What gentleman would associate with him? We have a series of rhetorical questions here. Um, but the idea here is you can know somebody by their acquaintances. Everybody that Dorian knows seems to end up with a bad end or a bad situation. And I think this is telling about Dorian as a person, and, and uh, Basil is obviously extrapolating from it. Stop, Basil. You're talking about things of which you know nothing, said Dorian Gray, biting his lip and with a note of infinite contempt in his voice. You ask me why Berwick leaves a room when I enter it? It is because I know everything about his life, not because he knows anything about mine. With such blood as he has in his veins, how could his record be clean? You ask me about Henry Ashton and Young Perth. Did I teach the one his vices and the other his debauchery? 
pause again. So vice.